Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. Thanks to DEF CON for having me. Um, my name is Jeremy Duro. Today I'm going to present to you guys on two different variants of an attack that I made for the uh, USB rubber ducky. What we got here? One minute. Or is that just their screen? Are these screens screwed up too or no, just that one? All right, cool. All right, so yeah, so we made two different payloads for the USB rubber ducky that will decrypt the uh, Wi-Fi communications. Um, yeah, so before we get started though, quick disclaimer. Um, I'm here on my own behalf. It's my own opinions, um, not my employer, no one else, so we get the legal jargon out of the way. Yeah, okay. Oh, so what, what are we doing here? Yeah. Sorry. All right, here we go. Sorry, guys. All right, so about me. A little bit of background, uh, a little more than a decade of uh, experience in the IT security industry. Uh, in those 10 years plus, I've worked for a couple different sectors. I started my career out with the uh, Department of Defense, working for the Army at a data center, hosting uh, both class and unclass material. Um, left out of there to go work in the ener energy sector, defending a nuclear power facility. Uh, and then currently, I'm working in the financial sector um, as a network security engineer for Jim Worth Financial. And just a little side note there, a little fun fact, uh, as a hobby, I enjoy building, driving, and destroying demolition derby cars. So if there's any gearheads in the audience, feel free to find me afterwards, we'll talk cars. So the presentation outline, what we're going to talk about. Uh, from a high level, we're going to first talk about what is a USB rubber ducky, for those who are not familiar. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, how the attack actually works, and then we're going to get into the details of each of the different payloads. So we'll first talk about the uh, keyboard payload, and then we'll talk about the one that involves both keyboard and USB mass storage. I'll demo the second variant of the attack, and if we have any time for questions, maybe we'll take some questions, but it's probably going to take the full time. All right, so again, those who are not familiar with the rubber ducky, in a simple description of what it is, Think about if you were able to take a keyboard and apply some type of logic or some type of memory to it to tell it what to send to a victim's machine when you plug it in, and you ultimately have the USB rubber ducky. So um, these devices are sold by Hack5. Those who are not familiar, they're actually selling products here. Uh, run by and support them. Really, really good, good group of guys. I think they're like 40 bucks or a little, little better than 40 bucks. So it's pretty cheap. So here's what the rubber ducky looks like. Uh, you'll notice that it is a um, very common form factor. Uh, so, so notice uh, there on the far right for you guys, the, um, you know, if you've been to any of the trade shows, like any of the IT security stuff, typically as vendors hand out swag, a lot of times it'll be that's the actual form factor. So if you've gone to some of those, you look in your drawer, you probably have one that looks very similar to that. Uh, inside the, the enclosure, you'll see that it has a micro SD. Uh, card storage area, as well as a little microprocessor, a little 32-bit chip. And again, that's what kind of drives the, uh, the memory part of the brain from that previous slide. And to, to kind of talk about the different ways that the Ducky behaves, uh, it comes shipped with the Duck firmware, which is that kind of that first bullet there. And again, that is just keyboard input. Um, but there's also those out there, just Fat Duck, Detour Duck. But make note of that last uh, variant of the firmware as well. That involves having both USB mass storage at your disposal when you plug the device in, as well as programmable keyboard. So a lot of powerful things can be done once you start adding mass storage. And we'll see that in a demo later. But uh, for those that are like, you know, thinking, well, this must be a Hack5 presentation. He's trying to peddle their products. You don't have to go with the Hack5 rubber ducky. There's other options out there. Uh, Sammy Cam Carr, he's actually here, spoke with him last night, so he's got a presentation later today. I, I recommend you guys support him, really smart guy. But he, uh, he, he developed the USB drive-by, so he does the same kind of mentality with the uh, Teensy device. 
Uh, so check his stuff out if you don't want to spring for the 40 some odd dollars for the uh, rubber ducky. As well as um, last year at Def, uh, no, Black Hat, um, Carson Noel and Jacob Lull did the uh, bad USB, those that are familiar with that term. Uh, and then later uh, at DerbyCon, um, Adam called on Brandon Wilson released code so that you can take a off-the-shelf variant of uh, a flash drive, uh, flash their firmware to it, and more or less it'll run the same scripting language that the rubber ducky run. So that's more or less free uh, if you have those flash drives laying around. All right, so how this attack works? Uh, this slide just depicts uh, the victim um, having a wireless connection to the little radio there, and you see the lock. So any SSL connections they have are working as they should. Um, everything's encrypted. You know, any any anything that they're supposed to be encrypted is encrypted. It's the standard connection before the attack. Then comes the the rubber ducky. If the rubber ducky was the USB flash drive was plugged in, uh, first thing that's going to happen. There's going to be a trusted certificate that's loaded on that victim's machine. After the trusted certificate is loaded, it will then move the wireless connection over to a man in the middle machine, which I will be running. So if you kind of think about this in your head, what just happened, not only are we now man in the middle, but since we provided that key, there's nothing that I cannot decrypt, right? So it's kind of a bad situation for that victim. All right, so first question I had when I bought it was, you know, is this a novelty device? I mean, yeah, it's great to rickroll your buddies with it, and, you know, yeah, that, yeah, cool. But... Does this thing really have a place in the corporate environment for, say, a real CT, you know, an actual pen test? Or is this a real useful tool for, you know, a black hat for that matter? And, you know, I was kind of astounded to see these, these numbers. Uh, you may have heard these before, but DHS obviously had the same thought, and they paid a third party to perform a study where they dropped flash drives around public areas, whether it be smoking areas, walkways, what have you. And they found that an astounding... 60% of people plugged them in once they picked them up. Well, yeah, that's scary enough, but then if you look at the last bullet there, if they add an official logo to it, that number jumped to 90%. So the moral of the story here is that you really don't need any clever social engineering for this attack to work. I mean, if someone really wanted to be bad and do this attack, you know, for $400, you've got 10 of them. Someone's going to plug it in. Your odds are pretty good. And speaking of official logo, if you recall the form factor, of what the rubber ducky ships. This is just a quick Google search of uh, marketing USB drive or something. Ta-da, first one came up, the exact same form factor that the rubber ducky ships in. For a couple bucks, you can put whatever logo you want on your rubber ducky, because it's just a little shield there that connects to it. And you're up to your 90% mark according to a DHS study. So pretty, pretty useful stuff. I kind of want to talk about now why I actually made this payload. Um, you know, there's plenty of good ones already out there. The rubber ducky, is, it's nothing new. Uh, the product's been out there for a while now. Um, and Darren, the guy that runs Hack5, has a, uh, his GitHub is just full of, you know, really good payloads that people have written. But what I found is that most of those, if not all of them, would be stopped by the modern defenses that are deployed in most enterprise organizations. So I'm not talking about your... You know, if you're trying to attack the random victim at Starbucks, I'm, I'm more focused on corporations and, and doing this thing in a you know, more secure area. And the first one I'll touch on there is antivirus. So a lot of the payloads that are out there will try to pull down a tool of some type, whether it be um, you know, Netcat or try to do some interpreter reverse shell, what have you. Well, you know, that's cool and all, but if you pull those down on a company asset, you know, your antivirus is going to light up like a Christmas tree and it's going to just stop it in its tracks. I mean, they're, they're just too well known at this point. The next bullet there, um, web filters and proxies. So uh, some of the other attacks, what they'll do is they'll try to make you go out to some open storage place, you know, Dropbox or Box or something like that. Well, most organizations, at least if they're, you know, more on the secure side of things, are going to block those style sites. They're not going to let you go to just any open storage to pull down any random file you want. So that's going to be stopped. Same kind of mentality below with the FTP whitelist. Some of the attacks try to pull down files through FTP. Again, most companies, if they're at the level of any security knowledge at all, they're not going to just allow you to FTP anywhere from any asset in the organization. And then the last bullet there is 
uh, has nothing to do with corporate security. Um, I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with HSTS, but those that are not, um, it's kind of a tool that was designed just to stop this style of attack. Um, so the old school way of doing man in the middle attacks would be, you know, once you've gotten in the middle of the communication path, you would tell the victim, you know, just, just go ahead and talk to me in clear text. You know, trust me. Talk clear text to me. You know you want to talk encrypted to your banking site. Well, I'm telling you to go ahead and load in HTTP so I can harvest the credentials. And then on the side that's talking to the real banking website, you would talk encrypted. And, you know, it worked well for a while until things like HSTS came along, which is an actual browser-based security mechanism. It says if you're a member or you're on this list of HSTS-enabled sites, no matter what the man-in-the-middle machine tells you, you must always use encrypted traffic. And that becomes a problem because it kind of thwarts the way that uh, the old school way of attacking took place. And, and again, a lot of your big sites are doing that. You know, you're a lot of your paid sites, like you see PayPal and your social media sites. Even DEF CON implemented this year. So I guess DEF CON's got some super secret information they don't want someone to get. Um, so let's start the attack. Enough kind of pre-talk. So the first step is to actually set the man in the, the, man in the middle machine up because um, you have to have something for the, the victim to connect to, right? So this is not the focus of the attack, so I'm going to kind of breeze through this stuff, but uh, just to give you an idea of what I used when I set up the demo you're going to see in a minute. Um, I used host APD as the, for the wireless radio. I used DNS mask for the DNS server as well as the DHCP server, IP tables to kind of direct the traffic over to a proxy, and I mentioned the Mana Toolkit, so those guys actually have um, developed some really cool scripts that I, I used um, to kind of just adjust their stuff to make it work the way I wanted it. So I mentioned proxies, or the IP tables that move stuff over to the to a proxy. So you got to think about it. Once you get the connections coming into your man in the middle machine, and you've got the radio, it's listening, people are connecting to you. You have to have some way to manipulate the traffic, or at least view the traffic. I mean. What's the point of sending it through you if you can't do anything with it? Uh, so you're going to have to set up some type of proxy. Um, in my example, I use Burp Suite. doesn't mean you have to use Burp Suite. It's just uh, easiest in my opinion. You can use SSL, Strip, Squid, Mallory, whatever. I do make note here that whatever proxy you want to use for this style of attack, make sure you know how to pull the certificate out, the actual signing authority it's using, because we're going to have to convert that certificate to a base 64 encoding. And I'll get into that in a little bit. So for those that are not familiar with Burp Suite, uh, I'm sure most of you have at least seen it. Uh, the configuration I'm using today is very, very simple. It's, I've just got it listening on all interfaces, just pick the random, you know, the 880 port, and you'll see there that invisible box, as they call it, is checked, but um, industry, that's a transparent mode proxy is all it's doing. And I mentioned you had to export your certificate. Well, that's what the little radio, I mean, the little button below that there, CA certificate, you click there, and you'll kind of go through some dialog boxes to export the certificate. And when you do that, it's going to come out in a DIR formatting. So again, this is not a talk about certificates, but at least I want to touch on this. The certificate, if it's in DIR formatting, you'll notice that top window there, that's text that I can't enter by keyboard, right? So I want you to make sure I convert that certificate to something that my ducky can type in easily. So use an open SSL, convert that DIR formatting to a PIM formatting, so it's a base 64 encoding. And if it's done right, you should look something like in that bottom window. So it's, it's human readable, all letters and numbers. All right, so now we have the man in the middle machine set up. Let's talk about the payload itself that's going to be sent to the, to the victim. So what it's going to first do, it's going to bypass the Windows UAC and open a command prompt window. If the user is logged in with admin credentials, it's going to get admin credentials. If they're logged in as user credentials, they're just going to get user credentials. And uh, the test that I'm doing today, I am actually have admin creds, but I will make note that this will work with user credentials without admin creds. It's just going to have a few extra pop-up boxes along the way. The second step it's going to do is create that .sir file. So you're just going to create a certificate from keyboard input, um, the same certificate we exported a few minutes ago. Then it's going to add that certificate to the trusted root store using the built-in tool cert util. Then it will create a new wireless profile and then connect to that wireless profile. And then lastly, it's going to clean up its tracks. So it's going to delete the files that it made in the process. All right, so before we actually look at the code, I kind of wanted to let everyone at least understand how simple this thing is to really write. So 
Uh, Def Con gave me a lot of credit by making me talk to you guys, but really, uh, you know, it's pretty simple stuff. Um, you know, it, it, again, very straightforward. Delay, delay in milliseconds. Strain what you're actually typing to the machine once you um, activate the payload. And then all your command keys, like enter, GUI is the Windows command, um, you know, remark. And any question on that, um, the GitHub ha that Darren keeps up has uh, pretty much all the documentation needed to any of the commands here that it supports. All right, so here actually is the first step in the payload. Kind of broken it out here a little bit. So you'll see how the code kind of works. Delays 10,000, so that's 10,000 milliseconds. That's 10 seconds. And the idea behind that is when you plug the device into a machine the first time, you're going to see Windows spin in there with the drivers, load drivers, load drivers, load drivers. Hopefully it's done in 10 seconds, and then it's going to enter the uh, issue a GUI R command. Those who are not familiar with GUI R, that's going to open a run dialog box. And it's going to delay 200 milliseconds to allow time for that box to pop up. And then it's going to type a little PowerShell command, start process command, verb run as. All that does is open the dialog box that's in admin credentials, if possible. And a little side note here, uh, you'll see that I put a little side note that Windows 10, and this is as well as 8, you don't have to do that PowerShell command for those that are not got the Windows 10 8 thing. If you just do GUI X and then type A, it opens up a admin and command prompt. A little side note. Um, so next step is we're going to have to create that certificate on the victim's machine with keyboard input. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to use a built-in tool of Windows called CopyCon. Those that are not familiar with CopyCon, it's CopyCon, file name, and then anything below it is concatenated to the file. You break out of it and now you have a certificate. All right. And I had to put the obligatory picture of the hacker in the presentation, but uh, I noticed earlier when I was going on my slides, like, this poor guy's having a hard time typing because he's got like big, thick winter gloves on. So I don't know. Well, I don't know where I, that's what I Google search for a hacker. Anyway, um, so we're going to use this, in my opinion, is the climax of the attack. So this is the part where it's actually doing bad things. Cert util, add store, enterprise. So that's added to the machine root store. It's adding that certificate we just created. So if this command succeeds, game over. Lastly, we're going to create an XML file, and again, those are not familiar, Windows, WIT, Handles, Wireless Profiles, just a little XML file. So we create an XML file, and then we, after we create it, we then connect to it with a NetSH, NetSH command. Again, pretty straightforward stuff. And lastly, we'll just delete those XML file and the certificate file that we created. All right, so here is what it looks like from the attacker's machine, right? So this is, again, burp suite. Um, and we're looking at the proxy kind of view there. And I've kind of highlighted there, you know, we're typically going to be interested in post commands. So I've kind of looked at a post command there to Wells Fargo. Um, I'm not picking on Wells Fargo, so hopefully don't sue me. But uh, I just any bank would work. Um, and you'll see down at the bottom in the details, you've got uh, user ID and password, clear text, right? So that poor person's bank was just compromised. And then alternatively, this is what it looks like from the victim's point of view. There have been no pop-ups, no warnings, no errors, no issues, no indication there was anything wrong. And I've even kind of opened up the certificate details to show that this certificate was signed by, uh, you probably can't read that, but it's issued by Port Swigger. Those who are not familiar, Port Swigger is a company that actually writes Burp Suite, so they put their name in the certificate. Um, but, but yeah, so, so really bad day, uh, Internet Explorer, you know, got the best of them. But I'm sure some of you in the crowd are like, well, I don't ever use Internet Exploder. I'm cool. I use Chrome, so you, there's no way you'd get me. Well, here's Chrome. Same deal. Uh, look at their credential. I mean, look at the certificate details. You'll also see signed by Port Swigger. And again, same story. No pop-ups, no warnings, no errors, no issues. There's no fully transparent to the user. There's no way, by at least the certificate anyway, you'd ever be able to know something bad had happened. All right, so again, they have no more money in their bank account. All right, Firefox, though. How about Firefox? The special snowflake that Firefox is. Yeah, 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 clap. That's, yeah, it was a bad day for me, so I'm glad you all think it's funny. The, uh, yeah, so, so Firefox. Um, and, and I'm sure some of you know already why this is the case, but uh, so Firefox decided they're not going to trust Windows, Key Store, and Trust Store, that they're going to implement their own Key Store and Trust Store. 
So those commands that I issued earlier with the cert util, that's all for the Windows certificates. Um, NSS Labs has the tool you can download to actually manipulate Firefox cert, uh, certs because they have their own key store trust store, but it's not installed on a typical distribution. Therefore, it'd be very hard to use you know, on a victim's machine. So I kind of banged my head against the wall for a while, and you know, my face looked a lot like that image there for quite a bit, trying to figure out how in the world to get this to work. And I just couldn't come up with anything clever. So that kind of brings me up to the next variant of the attack, the twin duck that I referred to earlier. So twin duck firmware, again, just to recap, it mounts both a USB mass storage device as well as that same programmable keyboard mentality we just had before. So to use the um, twin duck firmware, obviously you're going to have to reflash the device. Not a big deal. Instructions are out there how to do that. Very straightforward. Um, and I will make one little side note here that if you're planning on making some attacks using the twin duck firmware, it's not really designed for a really fast I.O., so don't be trying to load some massive application up on your um, you know, micro SD card and pull from it through command line because it's going to probably behave a little differently than what you expected. Just a quick side note there. So, um, so let's start this attack. How we're gonna, how we, what's different this time? We have to set it up. First steps are to create a new Firefox key store trust store. And the easiest way to do that is go ahead and infect your own browser. So go ahead and open your own Firefox up and um, take that certificate that you just exported from your proxy, load it into your own browser. All right, and I've kind of listed here how to do that. I'm sure you all know, but you know. Go ahead and click trust the uh, certificate identities from that website. Yes, so that way Port Sawyer can sign anything through Firefox. Okay. After you do that, then you're going to pull your key store and trust store and copy it over to your micro SD card. And it's located in the path there listed on the screen. And that variable works for pretty much any basic install. You'll see it uses variables um, as well as a, a wildcard.default because it's going to give us some crazy number string dot default. So that, that path right there, if you just would enter that into your machine right now, it would go to your Firefox profile. And you're going to get those two files there listed in the bottom. You're going to get uh, the key 3 DB and the cert 8 DB. That's your key store and your trust store for Firefox profiles. All right, so again, from a high level, how this attack's going to work now that we've done the pre-work to set it all up. Same as before, it's going to open a command prompt with admin creds, if it can get admin creds. It's going to then, this time, a little bit different, it's going to create a script to identify where that mass storage was mapped. Right? So again, we've got to think about this. We're going to it blind. We don't know what's going to be on the machine once it's plugged in. So it could be mapped to E drive, F drive, you know, who knows. Uh, so a little script, try to find where the Ducky USC mass storage is located. Then it will create another script, a little VBS script, that will run a batch file invisibly. And when I say invisibly, it's just running in the background. And the idea behind that is it's quicker to write a script on the screen because it's all done with keyboard input than it is to run the whole, write the whole batch file out. And it just gives you a little less time that text is kind of scrolling across the screen. But what that batch file is going to do, it's going to first add, just like before, it's going to add the uh, Windows trusted root certificate. It's going to then overwrite the user's Firefox cert and key store. And then it's going to create a new wireless profile, connect to it, clean up. All right. So here's what that uh, batch file looks like, just for those that are looking for the, the code part of the talk. Um, you, you'll see here, we obviously kill Firefox. We don't want to do anything while it's running. Um, we, same commands, add it to the Windows uh, Enterprise Store, the machine store. And then you'll see that it overwrites the uh, Firefox profiles. All right. And as a quick view, here's what the micro SD card looks on, looks like on my device. I'm getting ready to do a demo. Uh, you'll see the XML file, which is the wireless profile. You'll see the cert file, which is what we loaded to Windows. You'll see the uh, cert and key files for Firefox, as well as the batch file we just looked at. So there's the files that are needed to run in the twin duck mode. All right. So again, we'll go back to looking what it looks like from the user's point of view or the victim's point of view. Internet Exploder. Yeah, got them. Chrome. Same story. No more money in their bank account. Firefox. Yay, Firefox. Yeah, sneaky bastard. Gotcha. So 
You'll see it's also been signed by Port Swigger. We got them. Um, again, because we loaded those trusted certificates into their own key store and trust store. So at this point, I more or less consider the attack successful, right? We've got all three modern browsers, um, and yeah, they, they, they've, they've all been pwned. So with that being said, thank you, thank you. So we'll kind of dive into the uh, demonstration now, and I kind of want to set this up so it makes somewhat of sense because I obviously don't have a nice environment here to have someone over there getting attacked and be able to show you guys. So what, what's going to happen is, hopefully, and please, no one in the crowd be that guy that tries to mess up my SSID, please. If, I, if you do, whatever, I've got a video, but I'd rather do it live. So, so please don't screw with it. Um, there's going to be um, the Windows machine, which I'm presenting from, that's going to be the victim, right? So you'll see Windows machine is where I'll actually apply the rubber ducky payload, but there's going to be a Kali Linux box. It's going to have a Debian background to kind of represent which is which. It'll be a Debian background VM that has, I've got a bunch of like USB connections up here. I can't really show you, but I've got a USB connection into a hardwired out to the internet, as well as a wireless radio that uh, is going to be hosting the SSID from the VM. And when the payload is deployed, hopefully the built-in wireless on the Windows machine will connect to that wireless radio, right? So it's all kind of in one, but it should depict what the attack would look like. All right, so let's do that now. Without further ado. So that's what the Windows machine is going to look like. I could say I'm going to change it to you can clone the machines again. Yeah. Okay, you should be able to see my desktop now. All right. So yeah, here's going to be the victim, and let's go ahead and pull up super secret password. All right. So before I actually get started, my resolution is all whacked out now, but um, this is the script that I was talking about, the MANA toolkit script that I kind of modified. So again, for anyone that wants to take note, it's um, you know using host APD again, using DNS mask, and then using some IP tables to redirect traffic. All right, so let's actually do that. Let's kick that off. Actually, before I kick it off, let me show you. Again, here's the, I've already got Burp Suite up and running. So it's just listening on any interface on um, port 8080, and it's in transparent mode, and there's where, again, where you'd go to uh, export those certificates. All right? So let's go ahead and run that script. Hit enter to kill me. That's a little brutal. Okay. Um, so at this point, what I should see if I were to look, yeah, all right, there's uh, SSID being broadcasting. So it's actually trying to connect to it. But I'll, I'll disconnect from it once it, just to prove that this, this does work. But so, yeah, let's disconnect from that. All right. So now again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to restart the payload. So I'll just this would be an indicative of me plugging in. You know, I'm a dumb user that picked it up and I decided that, oh, I found a nice flash drive. Let me see what I can do with it. All right, 10 seconds. This is where drivers would be loaded, but I already have the drivers on the machine. And the payload has now started and it's now done. Um, so that's how long it takes to do its magic, right? Yeah. yeah, so there you'll see now it's connecting like it's supposed to be doing. It just takes a little bit. All right, so you guys are being nice to me, not kicking me off there. Appreciate that. So what we're going to do is now we're going to, and again, you, you guys already probably know damage can be done now that I've got this connection in this shape, but just for grins. We'll go to a Facebook account that I created just for uh, this presentation here. So please don't. 
own my Facebook account. All right. And then we'll also go again for Wells Fargo. I could use any other bank, but they're not my bank, so that's why I chose them. All right, so let's go for DEF CON user and then some super secret password. Let's log in. I hope to God this is no one's password. That would be awful. Let's see here. All right, nope, obviously didn't work. Okay, perfect. So let's kill out of that. So to just demonstrate, all right, here we got, okay, we got some data. So the attack is working as we'd expect. So let's first look at Wells Fargo. You'll see like I had in the slides, there's the uh, authentication packet. You'll see the post, to the auth logon. If I just go down here to parameters and I scroll a little bit, you guys I hope you can see that on, whoa. DEF CON user, password D3F CON 23. So yeah, let's go ahead and transfer all the money out of that account. Got him. All right, thank you. And now you, you may be kind of trashing your head like, well, dude, you, you forgot to put a password in Facebook. You know, <laughs> good luck getting that password now. Uh, you messed the presentation up because it was one of those little click box, leave me always logged in, which I think we all kind of know what that means is you're using authentication cookies. That actually may be even worse because any of the Facebooks, anyone who knows anything about Facebook and how they do their authentication cookies, um, let's see here, drag it up so you can see it a little bit better, but like every packet that you ever send to Facebook, you'll see this DATR cookie. Yeah, that's your authentication cookie. So every time you do anything in Facebook, it just sends it over and over and over and over. So I can click on pretty much any of these posts and you'll see, yeah, look, there it is again. And there it is again. So what we'll do is we're going to go ahead and say, let me just have those cookies for a minute. And then I'll go over here to this account and just to prove there's no shenanigans going on. I'm not logged in. Yeah, see, I just refreshed. No one's logged in here. But with the help of a little tool for those that are familiar with Grease Monkey, it's just a scripting tool. And I've got the uh, cookie injector script loaded. If I go in here to do, yeah, let's go ahead and take those cookies I just stole and paste them in. Well, thank you. All right. Yes, so now we have hijacked the session. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. So, and again, the point being there is it's not that Facebook's really your end goal when you attacks, but there's so many sites now that are using the authentication cookies. Uh, I think that Facebook kind of just drives the point home that anywhere that uses the authentication cookies or passwords, really doesn't matter. Once you're encrypting the traffic, it's, you know, the, the data is yours. All right, so let's go back to presentation. I think it's going to see your current slide. Wait for it, wait for it, got it. All right. So now, since, uh, like I, I told you guys at the beginning, I'm not a fan tester. I'm not a security researcher. I am a security engineer. So I am paid to defend against these attacks, not create them. So it's only fair that and responsible thing that I talk about is how to stop this kind of attack. All right. So the first bullet I want to touch on here is wireless intrusion prevention systems, so WIPs systems. Those are not familiar with those. Um, they're very powerful. But this style of attack would not work because as soon as I'd spin up that rogue AP, it'd, it'd start flooding me with DOF packets and it, would, it, it just wouldn't work. So if your organization deploys some type of WIPs environment, you have to find some other mechanism to get into traffic to you other than through wireless. Um, disable mass storage devices. Uh, this is becoming more common um, just because of these, I guess, there's lots of style attacks, so not, as, not to mention DLP concerns. People are starting to disable mass storage. But that's also um, kind of a bummer if you're trying to do that second variant of the attack because if you don't have mass storage available, you can't get all three browsers, at least the way that I did the uh, payload. And if you take that kind of mentality a little step further, a little more extreme, some companies even disable USB ports entirely. Uh, that would certainly limit the attack because none of the um, USB style attacks should work if you want to turn on. 
And then this slide, I mean, this bullet I put it in there. Frankly, that bullet could be in any DEF CON talk given this weekend. I mean, user training can always be encouraged to be more responsible with X. Just today, it's USB usage because that's what I'm talking about. So, yeah, you can always use more user training to encourage responsible use of technology. Multi-factor authentication. Um, yeah, so if I was able to pull this attack off on you, and you're using some kind of one-time use password or some token-based password, uh, it's going to be very difficult for me to reuse that, that, that credential. Um, so yeah, that's another check in the box for why you should use multi-factor authentication. And the last one here, it may not be quite so obvious, but uh, those familiar with cloud proxy agents, uh, a lot of organizations are now starting to deploy them. So on all the corporate assets, what that does is it requires the company asset to talk directly out to a cloud resource for their proxy uh, exceptions. And typically it has some type of authentication mechanism built into that. So if I got in the middle of that communication, it would probably just break. It, it, it just wouldn't allow you to go anywhere. And I wouldn't be able to decrypt anything because it would have broken your connection. So a couple other things here um, to consider. Um, the uh, The... I use wireless as the mechanism of getting the data to me, but that certainly doesn't have to be what you use. Um, you, could, you could set up like a proxy that listens out in the cloud, right? And instead of changing wireless settings, you could go in and say, let's monkey with some of the uh, proxy settings to have it, no matter if it's hardwired, wireless, whatever, you always connect out to like say AWS proxy listener. And you could have the same, same kind of attack take place. And the benefits there is, um, one, again, hardwired or wireless, but you also don't have to be in physical proximity. So you could deploy this thing, um, and then no matter where they went, it'd be connected out to like a cloud listener. And you could also uh, increase the authenticity. And what I mean by that is, again, I made this as just a proof of concept. Um, you know, the files are labeled what they are. Uh, you could certainly label them more, you know, suspicious things that people would be trying to really click in. Like if I was trying to make it more authentic, I'd probably put in a file that says like salaries or something, and uh, you know I'd corrupt it so they keep trying to open it just to buy me more time of that screen in front of them before they thought something was fishy. Uh, as well as we talked about putting a label on the device, you know you could print out whatever label you were trying to attack. So company X, put that label on it. Another note here that uh, the syntax will need to be adjusted slightly for whatever your victim base will be. And, and the reason I say that is certain OSs are going to have different dialog boxes pop up at different times, warnings pop up at different times, as well as timers. So if your timers are on like a, if you try to get it very aggressive on your timers on when things work, and you put it into a really slow old machine, the timers may not work out right and it'll break the whole attack. So you got to really play with the timer, play with the syntax, but you know, the, the attack should work pretty much regardless of any version of Windows. And uh, just a quick um, little shout out for the guys at Hack5. Um, they have a forum out there for people to share, collaborate, uh, new payloads. It's a pretty active community. So uh, if you're thinking about doing this style of attack or you're, uh, you're, you're looking at new ways to get into this kind of thing, I recommend you go check them out because um, that's where I got a lot of the ideas and some of the code that I use for my attack. Um, and with that, I'll finish here with uh, please, any questions you have, um, email me. Uh, I'm not going to try to do the question thing here in this forum. It's just too many people. But uh, feel free if you've got any questions, find me out in the, in the public areas. And, and with that, thank you guys all for your attention. I appreciate it.